you make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Medical communication is complex. Wait, let's start again. Communication between individuals is complex. The majority of what people perceive is the how, not necessarily the what. It's how you make your message known to someone. Through the tone of your voice, the timing, the speed, the pitch, your body language, all of it speaks volumes. Hello, how can I help you today? Hello, how can I help you today? It sounds obvious, but many times we're not aware of how our message is coming across. The short of it is always come from a good place. That good place may be trying really hard to be as compassionate as you can when you're tired or busy or distracted. That good place may be setting healthy, firm boundaries. Kindness and respect go together. It's hard for one to flourish without the other. Medical communication, of course, adds all kinds of crazy layers of unequal hierarchies and competing interests. As clinicians, we have our agenda, and the patients may have a completely different goal for the interaction. Or truthfully, they may not be able to tell you exactly what the goal that they have in mind is, just that they need help. We can all come up with stories and examples of times where we just feel that the communication has broken down. So, something new for this chapter of the playbook, we got some feedback and great ideas from our colleagues about, uh, let's just say, favorite examples of where communication went very wrong. Here it is, our top 10 list of communication errors waiting to happen. Now, this is not to say that we can't add to the list, and truthfully, they're not in any particular order of magnitude. Let's just use this as a way that we can start thinking about how we can trip ourselves up on the daily. Number 10. Interrupting inappropriately. Now, this may seem a little laughable in the ED. We're always being interrupted. A core part of being an emergency physician is the ability to be completely taken out of what you were doing, deal with the interruption, and go right back to what you were dealing with as smoothly as possible. Now, I'm not talking about the dozens and dozens of interruptions. Okay, hundreds of interruptions that you get every day. I'm talking about when the risk of the interruption is much worse than the risk of waiting for the appropriate time. Before you think, yeah, those nurses, remember we're all guilty of this. If a nurse is giving a report or at the Pixis trying to get out the right med for the right patient and the right dose for the right route, give him or her some space. That being said, if you notice a pattern of inappropriate interruption in your colleagues, wait for a good time and mention it. Some examples include pulling a curtain back and blurting out a question when you're in the middle of an HMP, or you're having a sensitive discussion with a family member or a colleague and you just get talked at from across the room. The interrupter is very well-meaning. He just wants to do his job, but here is the main danger with this overly casual mode of conversation. Just at a critical junction, just when you're trying to make a connection with someone or come up with a plan of care or just trying to get your thoughts straight, you're interrupted for something non-urgent. Your train of thought is derailed. You forgot what you were going to order or you missed that chance to establish the rapport that you're going to need pretty soon. And for what? So that a regular diet can be entered into the computer? Okay, well, how do we deal with this? We don't want to be whiners. Communication is never perfect and never 100%. But if you see a pattern in an individual, a 
very interrupty type of team member, find a good moment and have the courage to have a talk with him or her. Now, I, I can't tell you how to do this. You know what to do. But one good tip is to start with the why. Why is this so important? What can happen when you lose your train of thought? And try to use a specific recent example. Mark, thanks for always keeping me up to date on what's going on with the patients that we have together. I just want to let you know that it's important to find out first if I can even hear what you're telling me. Just now, I was explaining to Johnny's mother that he may need a bone biopsy. His WBC is high. He has petechiae. She was scared, and I couldn't be there for her 100% because I got distracted with this diet order. If it isn't urgent, could you please pause next time and just use your best judgment? Or you can always leave me a note on my computer. Thank you very much. Or some version of that. The interrupter will see that, hopefully, it's not about being difficult. It's about helping each other to succeed. Again, we as physicians are just as guilty. It's not really fair to go looking around for a nurse to help you. You happen to find them all congregated in a room trying to put in a difficult foley, and you arrive on your white horse, and you proclaim the epic saga that is your order for a CBC, a chem panel, and a urinalysis for another patient, and then right off into the horizon. Meanwhile, no one even realized you were in the room, and even if they had looked up at you, they wouldn't be able to see you with all that sweat pouring down their brow as they were focused on the issue at hand. So, I know that this ideal will never be completely realized by anyone anywhere, but we can all try a little harder not to trip each other up by blurting out whatever we want to get off our plate on someone whose plate is spilling over at the moment. Number nine, assuming an order is understood and carried out. Okay, I'm not that old, but I have been taking care of patients in one role or another for 25 years now. For the majority of that time, we charted and carried out or wrote orders, all with what I like to call a pen and paper. Now, that system was not perfect, but it did lend itself I feel, to better communication. When I received a written order that I didn't understand, I went to the person who wrote it, had a brief discussion to clarify, and I learned something. When I began writing my own orders as an intern or a resident or later on as attending, I would make sure to go over them with a nurse, with a clerk, or whoever they were for. We would have to go to a physical spot where there would usually be someone in a physical form who could talk with us in real life. It was a great way to make sure that what was intended to be communicated was in fact the message that was received. Also, any new updates could be discussed at the time in real time. Probably the single best thing with paper charting and orders was that the nurse could see what my priorities were and I could ask her immediate feedback and know that what she had on her plate at that time and what was feasible and what we needed to rethink. Real-time teamwork. Okay, this walk down nostalgia lane is actually for a purpose. We all know that things are very different now and they're not going back to how they were, but we can learn something from that previous workflow. It is true that having patients' prior notes at our fingertips is a powerful step forward for everyone, but what is the error waiting to happen here? Click, click, clunk. Beyond the endemic hazard of entering the order on the wrong patient, which we all do all the time, the error waiting to happen here lands not with a hard clunk, but with a soft splat. The order is just not recognized. Or there may be a question about it and someone just doesn't have time to ask you. Or you don't realize there was an issue with it until you see a little message on the tracker board telling you that the labs from two hours ago were hemolyzed or the patient refused or something that you would have liked to know earlier. From the nurse's standpoint, well, she told you by leaving a message for you. From your standpoint, you didn't even know there was an issue until you happened to see the little note. This is just an example, but 
you can see that we can over rely on the electronic medical record to the point where it's actually replaced human communication. Oh, I wanted to give Zofran wait 20 minutes and then PO challenge two year old Katie with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. If you just throw in those orders together, Zofran PO challenge, they may very well get co administered. Katie barfs up the Pedialyte popsicle immediately, and we just sent the parents' anxiety through the roof and their confidence in caring for her at home into the toilet. It happens all the time, and when I put it that way, you may just scoff and say, never, that would never happen to me. But of course, let's be real. We're all guilty of this. We do it to nurses all the time in the form of a miscellaneous communication order. All right, all right. It's not just communication errors that happen among colleagues. At least when we speak with nurses or physicians, we're all using the same language. We all know how the system works or how it should work. This brings us to number eight, not letting the patient know the plan. We know this, but why do we keep messing this up? I think it's because it's so obvious to us that we forget where the patient is coming from. You also don't want to over-explain and come off as an arrogant, pedantic doctor. Now, there are all kinds of things that we can be guilty of. Over-communication to patients is something I'm happy to err on the side of. The patient and his family are tired or hurt or scared or distracted or frustrated or just not completely present with you. Although it may seem like you're unnecessarily repeating yourself, just remember, repetition is comforting. It's another way that we can be explicit about our care and our concern for the patient. The family will see that you really want to make sure that everyone knows what's going on, what you're thinking, what tests you're ordering, and what may happen next. Of course, another great side effect from reviewing the plan is that if there's something that's not been addressed or mentioned, you can give the patient and family an invitation to mention any other concerns, to be proactive about avoiding missing something. For example, an otherwise healthy 10-year-old comes in for a cough. He seems well. He has a slight wheeze. He has a history of the same. The patient says he has no other medical problems and is otherwise doing well. There's no other red flags in the HMP. You may briefly mention a bronchodilator and quickly excuse yourself from the room to go see another patient. He seems fine. Or you may tell them what you're thinking. Jimmy has some wheezing. It may be from the cold that he had earlier this week, but I'd like to give him something to help open up his lungs and help him breathe better, and it may help him a little bit with a cough. We can see after the treatment. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about or any questions? To this, you may get the response, Oh, good. Will you be calling his heart doctor too? To which you reply, he has a heart doctor? Yes, anytime he comes into the emergency room, we're supposed to get in touch with the transplant team. Oh. So you see where I'm going with this. No medical problems to the family may mean no active issues with his anti-rejection meds. It seems silly, but we can be pretty quick with our interactions and make a lot of assumptions. Patients and their families may not feel comfortable interrupting us, or they may just assume that you know, since they come here quite regularly, or it's all on the computer, or they happen to tell somebody earlier. The doorknob diagnosis can always get us. And that brings us to medical error waiting to happen, number seven, using jargon. Lewis Carroll created some of the most vivid children's stories in English. An excerpt comes to mind from Through the Looking Glass. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Now, 
we're not going to get to the bottom of that argument here, but the point is that we may be using the same word in different ways or just using words that are not part of the patient's vocabulary. When we use medical jargon, we are not being professional. Mrs. Smith, Johnny has a Salter Harris type 3 fracture of his radius. He'll need to go to the OR. Uh, okay, doctor, thank you. And a blank stare. As efficient as that may sound, it did not communicate anything understandable, and actually that approach can end up causing more time and more anxiety and more explanation than if you simply said, Mrs. Jones, I'm glad you're here. It turns out Jimmy broke his arm right where the bone grows from. It's called the growth plate. The growth plate needs to be lined up properly with the rest of the bone, or he could possibly have problems later with how his bone grows. To make sure that we line up that part of the bone very well, he'll need surgery. Some breaks in the bone we can set with a cast. This break we have to be extra careful with and set it with surgery. Let's talk more about what that will mean, etc. Sure, it took an extra 15 seconds to explain, but mom now feels in control, empowered, and welcomed to ask more questions. This will save a lot of headache, pain, and potential elopement if they were waiting forever for the orthopedic surgeon but didn't realize the importance. Another phenomenon that goes under the jargon category is when we mix the medical meaning of a word with its everyday vernacular. Parents often describe their children as irritable, lethargic, inconsolable, and more. What does irritable mean to us? It means possible meningeal irritation and, practically, a lumbar puncture. What does that mean to mom? Well, he just didn't want to finish his vegetables today. Lethargic to us means get vascular access now and evaluate for sepsis, trauma, tox, etc. To mom, it may mean he didn't want to finish his vegetables today. You see what I mean here. Don't take words for granted or at their face value. Ask what they mean by that term. Number six, not managing expectations. This isn't lowering expectations or giving the impression not to expect too much from this visit. You are doing a lot. You are talking with a family, you are assessing the risk, you're delving deeper, you're examining very well, and you're investigating as appropriate. Managing expectations can really help to avoid all kinds of maladaptive behaviors, from complaints to not following through with your discharge plan, to giving the staff a hard time, to not coming back if a patient is worse, because why would I go back there? They didn't do anything. It starts with the other things we mentioned, clarity and communication, asking about any other concerns, explaining the plan. Most of the time, that's all you need. However, I know that you can just sometimes get a sense of when a patient or family has another agenda. It typically goes like this. Jenny is 10. She's here for abdominal pain. It's the same pain that she's had for over a year. She's seen her pediatrician multiple times. She's seen a specialist multiple times. She's had an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. She's followed very well by their gastroenterologist and doesn't have a specific diagnosis. She's been thriving at home. She's eating well. She's exercising well. And only the pain is happening when she's getting ready for school. It's fleeting. It's for minutes at a time and goes away. She has no symptoms on the weekends or holidays. The family is back because they're frustrated. It's 9 a.m. on a Monday, and they want answers now. Jenny's exam is normal, her vitals are normal, and she actually denies any pain currently. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't something going on, y'all. I'm just painting a picture that we've all seen before. After going through the list of all the possible dangerous things that she could present with, because it could be something new or it could be a complication of something that just hasn't been diagnosed, all of those things are possible. But we're at this point left with 
just a few things that come to mind and none of them are emergent or require any further investigation in the ED. The problem is the parents don't know that. Their frustration is the real emergency. This is a tough one because you want to do two things. One, you want to establish some rapport, but also two, set expectations and limits early on the visit. It's tempting very early on to let them know that it's going to be pretty doubtful that after a year of investigation by multiple specialists that we're going to somehow find out what's wrong today. Or let's be honest, this kind of situation is usually in the middle of a busy evening or night shift. Bonus points if it's on the weekend. So one piece of advice is to focus on what we can do. Instinctively, I thank them for coming. There are certain things that I can say she likely or does not likely have here in the emergency department. I'm going to focus on the most dangerous things first, mom and dad. Really, my goal is to keep her safe today and to get her specialists involved if she needs ongoing care. That little seed early on seems to help. People usually get the message that we're here to help and this is what will likely happen and this is what we can and can't do in the emergency department. If pressed, you can add, I certainly will do my best to see if I can tell what has been going on or if there's anything new. But honestly, you don't want me to make a diagnosis here. You don't want me to find something that I can find in the emergency room. I just look for really bad stuff. Hopefully she's well enough to go home today after I can talk with you and examine her. In this particular case, you'll want to make sure they know that you're taking their concerns seriously. This is probably the most important thing. People know and can feel your frustration, so just don't be frustrated. It's not about us. And of course, internally, you'll probe for other things like maybe medical neglect or abuse or family communication issues or bullying and all the things that a preteen has to deal with nowadays. After all of that, however, it is totally okay and encouraged to open the conversation up and Explain that although her pain may be very real, we may not come to a conclusion. And she is proving to us day by day that she's actually doing pretty well. She's eating, she's pooping, she's peeing, she's thriving, she's learning all very well. These are all good signs. Now, I do this just to open the discussion and thought that not every problem is medical. Going nicely down our top 10 is number five, not giving clear precautionary advice or follow-up instructions. You're brilliant. You are situationally aware. You listened. You asked great questions. You got a stellar H&P. You even made the diagnosis and came up with, no, don't be modest. It was an excellent plan of care to go home with. But You might as well crumple it all up and throw it in the trash right next to the old banana peel that's been there for a few days. If the patient doesn't understand his diagnosis and the need for aftercare at home or follow-up, then everything you did was for nothing. Here's an example. Three-year-old Isabella comes in with a hordeolum on her left upper eyelid. It's hot. It's red. She's ticked off. Otherwise, all is well. You have an awesome plan. You talk about warm compresses three times a day. You even go over a great technique to keeping them warm by placing a wrung out damp washcloth in the microwave, getting it moderately hot so that it's warm for an adult but not too hot for the child, and then wrapping that washcloth in another one that's warm, damp, and wrung out. That way, the heat emanates from the warmer towel but doesn't burn the child's delicate skin. You talk about using very dilute dandruff shampoo, uh, something with selenium, a tiny drop on a warm washcloth, creating some suds and wiping the eyelash line from nasal to temporal, just so that that extra stuff doesn't get into the tear ducts. Your plan is thoughtful, it's detailed, it's bulletproof. But you don't really explain in detail what she has or what they need to help her with or what the treatment actually does. 
Remember, it helps to dissolve the dead cells stuck in the bibobian oil glands to help them clear them all out. You're rushed, and you don't mention it. And if we don't clear this gland up, remember what can happen. She may end up with a chronic, granulomatous chalazion that will need ophthalmologic surgery. Granted, you explain all that in everyday words. See, I just did that myself. But you can take people through what to expect and what they can do about their disease course themselves. If they're engaged in the plan and they know their role in it, they're much more likely to follow what you feel is the best course of action at the time. So the little girl comes back two months later, the family's frustrated, and they want to deal with their Calasian now. And it's 2 a.m. on a Saturday. Coming down the stretch at number four is an easy one to spot. The number four error waiting to happen is rudeness. It seems obvious, but I'm not talking about just being nice. I mean realizing that rudeness turns off our frontal cortex and engages our mammalian brain, mostly ending in simmering rage that we spend exorbitant amounts of time and energy to combat or suppress or to deal with. Rudeness may come from colleagues. Don't allow it. Don't allow a culture of rudeness. Call people out, privately and kindly, for the behavior, not the individual. Remember, praise publicly, criticize privately. Nothing new here. More importantly, however, is that we don't let the patient's or the family member's rudeness to interfere with how we can help them. What was one of those rules that we're supposed to remember? It's the patient with the disease. So it has been written, and so it should be done. Families and patients may be rude to us for many reasons, and some can be very understandable. They're hurt, they're scared, all of those things that compassion can overcome. When people know that you're really trying to help them, that often softens them. What I'm talking about is not something that compassion alone can bridge. Most of the time, yes. The majority of the time, yes. But of course, there are some times when you're just dealing with a fixed personality disorder and we can't do anything about it other than to be as professional as possible. In cases like this, I'll do my best to spell out everything that will be done, do my best almost to overshow that we care, to to really spell out what our concerns are and what we really want to do, and stay focused on the care for the child, stay calm, and not to react to the rudeness. Remember, don't feed the trolls. Some people are just looking to throw down. Just be nice to them, let them live under their bridge, and help them however they'll let you help them. Sometimes a kind, firm word helps. Remember, boundaries, not barriers. Don't let people's rudeness brick your style. Hey, we're doing pretty well here. Down to number three. Here is one where team communication can break down. Not letting your team members especially your nurses, know what the goals of the visit are. I guarantee you, if you go up to the nurse as a colleague and you let her know right away that you need this teenager in a gown so that you can examine his knee, get him his pain medications before he goes to the x-ray, and no, he doesn't need an IV, she's much more likely to help get that done quickly. It also avoids a situation in which The films are done and the clothes are on and all kinds of artifacts show up and the pain meds are delayed until 30 seconds before you see them again, making your reevaluation almost worthless. Or the blurting of out of the question in front of the anxious parents, do you want an IV? This can go poorly, as in the kid loses it with his anxiety, or the parents demand it because they feel this is better treatment. You are the team leader, but your teammates are just as important as you are. Get everyone on the same page before you enact a plan. This is especially important in the challenging situations to avoid staff splitting. Okay, we're down to two more. Don't you feel more powerful? 
All right, here it is. Number two, downplaying your patient's symptoms or concerns. This is a tough one. I think the theme that we can see emerge here is just being aware, aware of how the message is perceived, being cognizant of what we say and how we say it, and asking yourself the question, is the message I'm sending out the same message that's received? What's the seemingly innocuous time that this could happen? Good news, Mrs. Johnson, it's just a virus. What do people hear when we say that? It's not what we think. They most often hear, why are you bothering me with this? Or, you really are complaining a lot for a simple virus. Or they may even hear that this is just a virus and there's nothing wrong and nothing will go wrong. But the problem is that even a simple virus can develop into something nasty, like post-infectious pneumonia or post-viral transverse myelitis, among, among many others like viral sepsis. We're not going to be winning any Nobel Peace Prizes for medicine by starting sentences to patients with it's just. But I get it. We are trying to reassure. Reassurance, true reassurance, that results in the patients feeling at ease It only comes when there is some relationship, some rapport that's been established. Sometimes it just doesn't happen in the ED for many reasons. Often patients are skeptical of all doctors, which may be one of the reasons why they came into the ED. We have to establish what we can in the time and the space that's allowed to us. So how do we do that? By listening and then listening some more, and really making sure that the patient and his family feel heard and understood. Now, I know that we can't spend inordinate amounts of time with people, but sometimes by just sitting down, just giving that sense of presence, and, you know, you're going to do it differently than I'm going to do it, but people know when you're listening. Just do that. Now, I know that your eyes may be wandering towards the back of your head right now, but remember, many have said this, but it is nonetheless true. People may not remember exactly what you told them, but they will remember how you made them feel. If they feel heard and cared for, they will much more likely do what you ask them to do. It's rough because you also don't want to scare people, but this is my analogy when giving precautionary advice. You want to either dial up the sensitivity or the specificity, but usually not both. Here's an example. You have a two-month-old who was brought in by his family for feeling warm without a documented temp. He does very well in the ED. There's no fever after an observation time that you have, and you're getting ready to send them home with careful precautionary advice. Here, you want to crank up the sensitivity in your precautionary advice. Here are the things that I want you to look for, mom and dad, and you list any and all the things that could possibly be any sign of fever or fussiness or vomiting or increased crying or decreased activity or anything that you think, even if you think they might have been having a bad dream, just come right in. You increase the sensitivity in your precautionary advice for vulnerable populations, like the very small and the very old or those with special health care needs, etc., By the way, you should also increase the sensitivity in the very stoic, very tough patients and families. Sensitivity here keeps patients safe by coming back appropriately. Conversely, if you have, let's just say, a worried ward type of family, you have Johnny, who's nine years old and He may or may not have had a fever, and he may or may not have coughed once yesterday, and his exam is great, it's normal, he's very well. You might want to dial up the specificity. When should we rush him back in, doctor? Well, at that point, you really want to try to help the family thrive at home. So you can talk about the, f- the fact that this is probably a viral illness. He's very well, that having a fever is expected. Luckily, he's vaccinated. Good job. He's going to do very well. It's okay to try to treat him at home for the first 24 to 48 hours and see how he does with over-the-counter medications. Your specificity might be dialed up also to include, 
see your doctor, or if you can't, I'm always here, especially for a fever lasting more than five days, if he gets really red eyes or a swollen neck or a weird rash or cracked lips. You see where I'm going with this. If you leave your return precautions too broad, then they will be back hours from now to the benefit of no one. Sometimes I add something to the well-meaning worried patients and their parents, um, especially for infants, toddlers, and the young. What I'll tell them is, you know your child better than anyone else in the world. If you think something's wrong, even if you can't say what, that's enough for me to want to see him again. Then they're much more likely to be calmer and listen to the specific return precautions. In this case, specificity keeps the child safe by keeping him at home appropriately and not in the clutches of iatrogenia. And finally, the number one medical error waiting to happen, and full disclosure, this was made number one because it's a personal crusade of mine, the number one medical error waiting to happen is... Referring to patients by their room number, their disease, their chief complaint, or any and all the above other than their name. Boom. I said it. Chances are you've done it. It's okay. Every day is a new day. Come with me to a better place. Think of it like this. You have 20 plus patients that you're juggling in your brain at any given time. You're bombarded with info and data and noise and interruptions constantly. And you're trying to get back on track constantly, sometimes from a minute to minute basis. Not to mention that you have to adjust your communication style to every patient or maybe even every staff member. It's a lot. Already in the ED, we are a setup for any kind of error, communication or otherwise. Just now, a busy nurse interrupts and says, hey, the guy in nine needs pain meds. What do you do? Here is where you choose your own adventure or malpractice suit. Now, this can go down one of a few ways. You can assume that you're both talking about the same patient and you want to please the nurse and go back to doing what you were doing. Hopefully all goes well. And if it doesn't, you may or may not find out about it during the visit. You can ask simply, who are you talking about? This prompts the nurse to give you more info or to catch herself. If you get a blank stare, and especially if you get the, uh, I don't know the name, you know, the one in nine, then danger, danger. Neither of you knows who you're talking about. This is a terrible situation, and in my view, it's negligent. You're about to do something to someone who may or may not do well with what you're going to give them. The blind order or even the blind advice. Remember, the nurse is asking you to act on something. I'm going to go on to ruffle a few feathers and call it unethical to apply a plan of action or give medications to just basically any random person. Now, you may say, I know who she's talking about. I was just there. Cool. Good for you. Does she? Remember, she is juggling multiple patients as well. Many times I've caught people calling patients by, say, room three. You go to check the name, allergies, etc. on the EMR. Oh, he's in room four. Uh, that's what I meant. It's jaw-dropping, and I see it happen all the time. Again, you just might not have noticed it yet. Now, granted, you don't want to be a drag. You don't want to be that guy. But... When you're asking a simple question that goes to the heart of patient safety and you do it with kindness, people react well and they'll thank you. But that also almost always means that you're going to have to stop what you're doing, click out of the window, get into the tracker, figure out who she's even talking about before you can answer. Sometimes you may just have to have them say the thing all over again because you had someone else in mind. So really, they need to prime you with who you're talking about first before you can even process what they're saying. But I think if they realize and see what you're doing and you maybe talk to them about it, you do this a few times, people start to know what you expect of them and you are creating and 
cultivating a culture of safety. In fact, it is so rampant and such a problem that I have to tell them that I can't even process what they're saying or or what they're asking before I even know who they're talking about. Hey, can I give him some morphine? A common question. If we're talking about Tommy Jones, who's a 12-year-old with a femur fracture, well, yes, by all means. If we're talking about Jimmy Smith, who's the one who's being admitted for bronchiolitis and dehydration, then no. Okay, here is the cold, hard truth, and forgive me for going a little dark on the playbook here, but it's just a harsh reality and part of this beautiful experience that we call human nature. People just want to get the problem they have off their plate. They want it resolved now. Instead of giving the problem a little thought or thinking about how you may misinterpret what they're saying, they jump in. They want to give you the most minimal of details and mark you down as a responsible party, MD aware. Add in a stressful, noisy environment, the fast-paced nature of it, expectations of everyone, bias, fatigue, hunger, angst. You've got yourself a perfect recipe for disaster. Everyone knows that two patient identifiers are needed before meds are given or a procedure is done. Remember, the verbal orders that you give, or just the permission you give to someone asking for it, it is an intervention. It will affect the patient. Do you want to just trust your working memory to that? Especially when the nurses routinely shuffle patients around, out of necessity, but they change the room numbers all of the time. Or because they're human beings, they misspeak. Watch out for them, watch out for your patients, watch out for yourself. So please, 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 my plea to you is to use the patient's name. Hopefully she hasn't been in the ED so long that they've had the opportunity to change it. Plus, regardless of the arguments, everyone has a name. The least we can do, the most humane thing we can do is to use it. Thank you for listening. There are very many, many more communication errors waiting to happen that just won't fit in a nice, neat top 10 list. Send them to me, and if we have more, we'll do another episode with more examples and more cases. I just want to take the opportunity to give a special thank you to my friends and colleagues who wrote in to share their stories with me. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandra Simmons. Dr. Ashley Saucier, Dr. Kelly Young, and Dr. Joe Connolly. Awesomeness like you all makes the world go round. All right, until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.